Reaching for the heavens, China's ever-expanding ambitions now include putting men on the moon, as well as rapid expansion of military capacity here on Earth. And all the while, its economy continues to grow at a rate far outpacing the economies of Western nations. With ever-increasing confidence, China's leaders have now stepped to the center of the world stage. And for many people here, that's exactly where they should be, given the country's history and civilization. But does that necessarily mean that we're entering a new era of Chinese exceptionalism, even dominance? Well, one influential author argues that it does, and his message is going down very well among the elites. Professor Zhang Weiwei served as a translator for one of the key architects of China's transformation, Deng Xiaoping. He's now an international scholar, arguing a case for China as the world's exceptional civilization. In his new best-selling book, he offers a robust rebuttal of critics, especially in the West, who keep emphasizing China's shortcomings. If China had applied a liberal electoral democracy, uh, we are going to have a peasant government. We could be very nationalist. They will launch war against Taiwan or Japan. <laughs> Professor Zhang Weiwei explains where China is going on Talk to Al Jazeera. Professor Zhang, first of all, thank you for joining us on thank you, Talk pleasure. to Al Jazeera. Now, your book, the China wave is causing quite a, a stir in China, <laughs> this and your other work, <laughs> yeah. in which you're basically proposing uh, and reinforcing a sense of nationalism that people are really connecting to. So let's discuss a little bit about the future of China and, and how it goes. Now, I want to ask you about what you have called the China model. Okay. What does that mean? Uh, basically, you know, when we discuss the idea of model, uh, you could interpret this as, say, something to be followed, copied, imitated by others. That's not my meaning. My interpretation of the idea of model is a summary or a description of the experiences and the main features of what China has been doing over the past three decades. And what are the features of that? Uh, for instance, we have a uh, relatively strong pro-development and uh, neutral government uh, that can shape national consensus for reforms, for many reform initiatives, for modernization. And it's a government with um, a very strong uh, capacity for execution projects. So this is uh, one major feature. Another feature of China model is uh, its uh, strong sense of pragmatism. I call this uh, practice-based reasoning. You have to trial and error. You proceed with caution, with experiments, and then you try to gain experience from this experiment, pilot projects, and then extend it to other parts of China, to other areas of the economy. And there are also other features, for instance, uh, this uh, gradual approach, which is very important given the size of the country the size of the population, uh, this uh, sense of uh, priority, sense of sequencing, uh, turn out to be extremely crucial for China's success. The phrase, a neutral government yeah. shaping national consensus is an yeah. interesting one. Yeah. I'll come on to that in a second, but let me just yeah. keep with the macro picture for a second. Now, you're, you're describing a country in transition with careful management and a, and a, a destination in mind, and that's been one of the, f the themes of your yeah. book. The question is, what is that destination? Because from uh, a lot of Western perspectives, uh, the inevitable uh, final arrival point for China is going to be <laughs> multi-party democracy, freedom of speech, all these good things from a Western perspective. Is that where you see it going? Uh, actually, uh, really, my humble uh, estimate of China future is not another uh, Western country. Uh, on the one hand, the country is uh, wide open to international competition, to engagement with other countries, to foreign trade. On the other hand, the country is also increasingly returning to its own roots. As I said in my book, uh, I call this civilizational state, which is the 
amalgamation of a, the world's longest continuous civilization and the super large modern state. So uh, this mixture uh, makes things exciting in China and make the Chinese experiment exciting. There are, there are institutions uh, of Western government yeah. and uh, Western economic policy and yeah. politics that would say, well, the essential elements of a successful uh, modern state yeah. are well known to us. <laughs> you need, you need si simply it's to true. adopt them. You're saying that's not going to happen. I mean, what, what are the pitfalls in, in those Western models? And yeah. what, what, what elements of Chinese culture are going to be implemented instead? Actually, uh, I had an interesting debate with uh, Professor Fukuyama, who wrote The End of History. Uh, that was uh, in June this year, just uh, three months ago, four months ago. And um, I said to him, what China is doing is actually a gigantic effort to explore the next generation of political, economic, social, and even legal systems. So there are all kinds of experiments, pilot projects, initiatives in different parts of China. They are different or complementary. Eventually, some better models will emerge and other parts of China will emulate. So that's a huge, large scale of experimentation. That's also very, very exciting. In other words, because China is now uh, fully engaged with the outside world. We know the strength of the Western system. We also know the weakness of the Western system. Given the current crisis in Europe, in the United States, it will be foolish for China, again, to follow the footsteps of the American model or European model. Mm -hmm. We should be selective in learning from the West. But again, what, what are the weaknesses that you have seen, and, and what are the, oh, the Chinese effects that yeah. you think should be substituted for those weaknesses? Yeah, for instance, I had debated with Fukuyama concerning the whole idea of accountability. Yeah. In his idea of liberal democracy, accountability refers to regular election every four years. You know. Be the Chinese experiment, accountability means a whole wide range of economic, social, legal, political accountability. For instance, at each level of the Chinese government, from the central to grassroots, they have this duty and task to promote job creation and economy. So when I was reading this, uh, uh, the whole argument about the crisis and the reason of it, it said that over the past 10 years in the United States, for instance, there was no job creation, no uh, growth of the economy. That did not happen in China. You go wherever in China over the past decade, past three decades, even go to any small county, there are job creations, there are economic growth. So I do not mean you know, China, the China model is perfect. We have our share of problems. But it seems that this approach has worked. Yeah. In other words, what we call this economic accountability. Uh, this is uh, something somehow still widely absent in the Western model. If we accept for a moment that yeah. accountability yeah. is much broader than simply political yeah. accountability and, and a vote every four yeah. years, it still doesn't answer the question as to where are the checks and balances, because if this accountability model relies only on the, mm -hmm. uh, the moral goodwill of the individual exercising mm -hmm. the power, you are still open to the realities, and China is as aware of these realities as everybody, given its history, you're still yeah. open to the reality that you will have a leader who isn't particularly moral, who <laughs> isn't particularly yeah. interested in the accountability to the people, H and has the power yeah. to, to do whatever he likes. No, actually, uh, this is uh, sometimes described, including uh, in Fukuyama's writing, it's called the bad emperor problem. When you have a good emperor in China's long past, the dynasty, you know, performed very well. We had a bad emperor. I'm sorry, the state of affairs declined. And actually, China has solved this problem. If you look at the top elite of the Chinese leadership, the nine members of the Standing Bureau of the Political Standing Committee of the Political Bureau, uh, you look at the uh, selection process. The minimum requirement for this post is uh, two terms as a number one in the province. 
And don't forget, China is a huge country. Each province could be the size of five, six European countries in terms of population. So it's by no means to uh, do a good job easy. It's by no means easy to, to, to be a governor and perform well for in running such a large province. And you have to do it twice before you have been able to meet the basic condition of this criteria. And, and, and so my, 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 my sometimes I joke to my American friend, I said, with this system in place, already in place, it's highly unlikely we will elect a guy like George W. Bush. It's way too below the bar. <laughs> it's unlikely. You speak, and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of Chinese philosophy speaks in terms yeah. of history. Everything is, is looked at in the long term. Everything yeah. is considered through the lens of, of previous experience. Um, and you have already said that yeah. this long-term thinking makes you believe that China will not go towards a Western democratic model. Let me just explore a couple of other of the Western priorities uh, here uh, and wonder which direction China yeah. is headed in. Uh, and one of those, of course, is human rights. Yeah. Now, the ultimate um, human rights yeah. uh, position of, of the Western nations these days has been fairly yeah. clearly articulated. Is China's human rights philosophy moving in that direction or somewhere different? If we adopt a uh, international standards, not US American standards, say the UN definition of human rights, economic, social, cultural, political, civil rights. Yeah. If we use that criteria, you know, it's interesting, you will see the Iraq war is a violation of human rights. 50 million people without insurance, a violation of human rights. China had its share of problems, but it's always remember, necessary to remember, when we discuss human rights, we have to first of all ask Chinese, not Washington, not Brussels, not Paris, not London. You ask ordinary Chinese, whether in China, in Beijing, Shanghai, elsewhere, in Europe, in the United States, what do you think of China human rights? Are they better now than before? I think, you know, by a conservative estimate, most Chinese think their human rights are better than any time before. That's very important. Again, that's yeah. part of a process. Yeah. What is the ultimate aim? No, the ultimate aim is uh, uh, we will draw a lot from Chinese own culture. Uh, we have a very strong tradition of humanistic culture. And uh, uh, this is not exactly, uh, in other words, they were born way before the European or the Western definition of human rights. We also respect these traditions, yeah, very important for the royal family, uh, sometimes uh, the need for sacrifice for the interest of family, for others. Let me put it in, the, in a contemporary yeah. context yeah. then, uh, this idea of, uh, of whose, whose rights are, are paramount. Yeah. The Occupy Wall Street movement mm. is, is an expression of what yeah. a lot of Western countries hold very dear, yeah. the ability of the individual to stand up and criticize yeah. his government and to take yeah. certain amount of action. Obviously, they can't do exactly what they want. Um, and is allowed to do so yeah. without being considered a threat to the system. Yeah. That wouldn't happen in China. No, uh, again, it's an interesting question in the sense that I always say whenever you discuss issue of human rights or values, you have to remember the exact context, say cultural, political context of country. You can do opinion surveys in China, yeah. We have all respect certain values and certain rights, but indeed, given the difference in culture and history, people attach different priorities to these values and rights. For the Americans, maybe freedom of expression is number one right. For the Chinese, you can do whatever service. Social order is the number one value. Yeah. Because I mentioned in my book, if you look at China's modern history, since uh, 1840, the Opium War, the maximum period of peace, stability, and order for China was eight to nine years. So the process of modernization was constantly disrupted by civil wars, peasant uprisings, foreign aggressions, and of course these ideological campaigns launched by Mao one after another. So people were fed up and are fed up with this kind of chaos. 
perhaps you know the government goes too far in ensuring public order. But on the other hand, if you feel the pulse of people, most people appreciate order. Let's go back to the, yeah. the, the, the bigger picture again and, and yeah. the, the evolution of a China model into a, a modern state that can manage 1.3 or by the time it's finished, probably 2 billion people yeah. effectively and efficiently. Um, is part of that state going to have a, a, an outward looking element? Is it going to be an expansionary model um, because as you know, a lot of the West, yeah. when they hear you say that yeah. we are not heading towards a multi-party democratic electoral system like the West, then they're going to say, oh my God, China's going to try and take over the world. Are they right in that fear? No, actually, uh, if you look at European history, uh, when the Europeans have this uh, one person, one vote, uh, it's uh, already after modernization was achieved. And if China had applied this uh, so-called today's you know, uh, liberal electoral democracy, uh, we are going to have a peasant government. Yeah. We could be very nationalist. They will launch war against Taiwan or Japan. You know. Actually, the current leadership shaped by Deng Xiaoping, the whole style of leadership, is uh, on the whole uh, cautious and moderate in its foreign policy, which is in China's interest. And um, uh, which is actually uh, also good for the Western interests. Uh, on the other hand, really, if uh, as uh, uh, some Westerners try to have a color revolution in China, uh, the end result will be disastrous, not only for China, but also for the West. Do you think the West yeah. is pushing for a color revolution in China? I think it's uh, foolish to do that. You know. In the first place, you can do any service in China. The popular support for Chinese government in China is much higher than popular support for any Western governments or even for Obama. You can but, but the service by PWP, by OECD, by Gallup, you know, you can do this. It's, uh, this is, is, it, is it your sense, though, that the Chinese government is yeah. fearful that the West will agitate for this kind of revolution in China? I don't know whether fearful is the right term. Actually, we're very confident in the sense that, indeed, I'm uh, but rather do think, optimistic. Do they, do they think the West is engaged in this kind of behavior? We have a time frame, see, 10 years from now. Yeah. Now, none of Western country want to say extreme positive things about China's political system. But 10 years from now, if China has become, as many people predict, the world's largest economy by PPP, purchasing power parity, if China's middle class by then will be twice the U.S. population. I mean, genuine middle class, American standards with private home, with a decent income, stable job, which could be a very real realistic scenario. Which explains... By that time, you know, the West will have to reassess the whole thing about Chinese political system. Well, China model. But the fear is that they will also yeah. have to reassess yeah. their own situation, yeah. which is, I think, what yeah. scares them most. Because yeah. in today's society, yeah. you have any number of global yeah. nations yeah. complaining about US uh, hegemony, yeah. both culturally, uh, in, yeah. uh, in business, uh, in, in all elements of life. If in 10 years from now you have a Chinese middle class that is twice the size of the entire US population, those same complaints, those same fears will be directed yeah at Beijing. That could happen, you know. Uh, I was uh, uh, in, say, a number of small countries, Laos, Cambodia, or even Vietnam, you know, I could uh, put myself into their shoes. Uh, say you have a neighbor a hundred times bigger and grow in 10% a year, 15% a year, and for three decades running. It's a bit fearful. But on the other hand, it's necessary to see the larger picture. Uh, China's long historical tradition shows China is not a kind of expansionist power. Yeah. China is, uh, if you compare Ch Chinese empire with the Roman empire, Roman pa empire was based on military conquest. And Chinese empire was based on supposedly cultural superiority. Yeah. If any neighbors accept this suppose the superiority of Chinese culture, and then uh, China accept a part of China or China's sphere of influence, and no soldiers will be stationed there. 
Of course, this is history. I don't think that will not be repeated. But there is one logic which is consistent. Um, the Chinese are uh, more introvert in the sense that we build a great wall to prevent others from invading us, rather than really reaching out, expanding, and uh, conquering other lands. I don't think that will happen. It's not in the Chinese blood. Being, no. being uh, or at least maintaining a, a sense of isolation may not necessarily be reassuring either, though. Yeah, that's true, that's true. It's, uh, you have to keep a balance between <coughs> opening up, engaging outside the world, at the same time being yourself. Yeah, that's important. It is very interesting <coughs> how consistently speaking with you and, uh, and in, in Chinese conversation, the, the idea of history is, is yeah. such a, a completely different beast than it is yeah. in Western discourse. I mean, you talk in terms of thousands of years, uh, and in the West, it's a three-minute culture, <laughs> as we all know. I mean, this, th there's a, a strange division there. Uh, and it explains a lot of the political decision-making yeah. process to a certain extent. That's true. Um, people criticize the invasion of Afghanistan, and the, uh, more like the remaining in Afghanistan, by saying, well, have you not seen what happened in previous invasions yeah. of Afghanistan? And yeah. uh, it doesn't seem to make any difference. Do you think that stark division in how people regard their political activities and the value of history in that decision making, do you think that can never be reconciled? Is, is, there, is one better than the other? No, when we said we have a strong sense of history, it's a I should say, a kind of Chinese logic. You know, you, there's no way to get rid of. Uh, because you, we use the Chinese language, for instance, and this language began to take shape in about 3,500 years ago, the writing system, yeah, which means 1,500 years before the Roman Empire, 1,000 years before the city-state of Greece. We are still using the same language. In the case of UK, for instance, uh, most PhDs cannot read Shakespeare. But in China, any good high school student can read Confucius, written 2,500 years ago. So you have so many hundreds, hundreds of proverbs which you use in daily conversation, which are part of this uh, Chinese culture and history. So this is a logic where we have to have it, no other way. On the other hand, when we say we are historical, we respect history, because we do believe that history contains a lot of wisdom. Yeah, that's very important. Sometimes I joke with my American friends. I said, my goodness, you fought many wars. You won these wars tactically, but you lose them strategically. Yeah. And this strategically, that's about wisdom. Yeah. Same with this you know, whatever Arab revolution, etc where the Western interests are, where the American interests are. There is a, 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 f a favorite cliche that a lot of Western media use, uh, which I don't even know if it's apocryphal or whether it's yeah. true, but they yeah. quote Zhou Enlai yeah. uh, saying, when asked about the French, French Revolution, Revolution, you've heard this one, yeah. and he says, what do you think of the French Revolution? And he said, it's too early to judge. Yeah. Don't you think that sort of mindset can actually be a political problem? Because, I mean, the value of the, the three-minute culture, at least, and, and the immediate accountability of leaders mm -hmm. is that they have to make decisions fast. And sometimes quick reactions yield better political results than slow ones. Uh, if you are indulgent in uh, your own old tradition value, that could be very harmful. Unless the British love nostalgia, that's fine. That's good. That's taste. That's fine. Now, politically, I think, you have to be forward-looking. So what China has been doing over the past three decades is, on the one hand, we try to keep our traditional roots. On the other hand, we make the country wide open. We have 400 million people studying English. 20% of annual publication in China <coughs> are translated books. China's largest newspapers in circulation is uh, uh, Global Times and Reference News, several million copies a day, both of them about international affairs. And we have 1.6 million students studying abroad, one third of them back in China. So, so it's, uh, if you keep the country open, then Chinese are good learners. Uh, so eventually, ideally, in the globalized world, uh, we need to have this kind of mutual respect 
and this kind of mutual help based on mutual respect. I That's think that will be the message from the China model. That seems like a good place to leave it. Thank you very much indeed. For Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much.